So hello everyone and welcome back to yet another episode of AWS series. I hope you are safe and healthy and it's a very tough time for all of us and I can understand how frustrating it can be to stay at home, stay inside and deal with the situation which is coronavirus. So it's a request that please take good care of yourself, stay at home, stay safe. And YouTube is awesome and YouTube is free. Stay at home, enjoy, relax and you can learn something new every day under isolation as well. So finally, after 50 days, we have completed a milestone in our journey in getting certified. And I'm very happy to share with you that I got my AWS Solutions Architect Associate certification completed. So if you want to know how I did it, how you can as well get one, I will upload an experience video soon. So do watch out for that. I gave my exam on 15th March 2020 for SAAC01 and I'm sure you would want to watch it. So please make sure you have subscribed to the channel without wasting any more time now. Let's go over the road to AWS phase map again. And this is the phase map that we have right now. We are in phase one and we have completed most of the topics that we have. And now currently we are having just three topics left. One is the Elastic Cache, Route 53 and DynamoDB. So sit back, relax and let's start off with Elastic Cache. So it's really a good thing to say at the start of the session that there might be a few tricky questions related to caching and elastic cache and it could be joined with another service to make it more relevant. So something like your company is starting to use AWS to host new web applications. A new two-tier application will be deployed that provides customers with access to data records. It is important that the application is highly responsive and uh, retrieval times are optimized. Uh, you're looking for a persistent data store that can provide a, a required performance. What AWS service would you recommend for this requirement? So for the solutions architect exam, AWS always wants you to read big lengthy questions, not always, but half of the time. So that the time you reach to the end of the question, you forget what you have read in the top half. So Elastic Cache for AWS is a fully managed in-memory data store compatible with Redis or Memcached and it powers real-time application with sub millisecond latency. So if you already have used Redis or Memcached, you might know that uh, what an in-memory data store is and how it works and what it is used for. So if you haven't, then let me tell you what in-memory data store means. So if you have used database before, databases are typically storage based and they are supposed to be persistent and they are stored on storage volumes. And on the other hand, in-memory databases are stored on volatile memory like RAM, which mostly is our main memory. And based on the computing knowledge we have, we all know that accessing the main memory is way faster than accessing your storage disk. And Elastic Cache falls into the category which uses the main memory, in turn, which is very, very fast. And there are two famous uh, in-memory data stores that we have, the Redis and Memcache that I've already told you. And remember just uh, like we have Aurora RDS, which is for Postgres and MySQL. Elastic Cache is for Redis and Memcache. Okay, so the way we are able to create instances for Postgres and MySQL using Aurora or RDS, we can do the same for Redis and Memcache using Elastic Cache. Amazon Elastic Cache allows you to seamlessly set up, run and scale these in-memory databases. So most important aspect of using Elastic Cache is that it boosts the performance of your existing databases by retrieving data from high throughput and low latency in-memory data stores. And you can make use of this for caching, session stores, gaming, geospatial services, real-time analytics, and queuing. And as it's an in-memory database, it gives you sub-millisecond response time. It is fast. Like when you think about sub millisecond, it's less than a millisecond. And you know, millisecond is a thousandth of a second. So it's very, very fast. Apparently faster than my first breakup. So <laughs> jokes apart. I hope you get the idea, isn't it? So Amazon Elastic Cache has no upfront costs. Uh, you pay only for what you use. There is no minimum fee. With on-demand nodes, you pay only for the resources you consume by the hour without any long-term commitments as well. So with reserve nodes, you can make a low one-time upfront payment for each node you wish to reserve for a one or three year term. And as it's AWS managed, it offloads the management, monitoring and operation of in-memory cache environments. And as I already told you, it provides support for two engines, Memcache and Redis. And for the GST and budget considering people, it provides detailed monitoring statistics for an engine node 
at no extra cost via Amazon CloudWatch. And Amazon Elastic Cache is available in all AWS regions and allows you to run your cache nodes in Amazon Private Cloud, that is a VPC. So that's one less thing to worry about, isn't it? So next off, let's check a very important concept about cache memory in terms of database. So to really understand the concept of caching and elastic cache and to really accept what the tools like Redis and Memcached have to offer, you really need to understand this simple but interesting concept, which is called cache hit and cache miss. So before we move into this, I want to ask you something like I told you that caching is faster and yes, it uses the main memory, but why is it fast and why do you need caching? So when you have a pool of data, or a set of data that you might need to retrieve very frequently and the frequency at which it changes is low then you are just going to access the same data repeatedly over a period of time and it would be a headache if every time you try to make a request and try to get the data back it takes a longer time that would be a headache isn't it so i'll give you an example uh, you are going to an information center booth or a information booth and there is a person who answers the most frequently asked questions like, hey, uh, which screen is the movie playing right now? He would say A2. And there might be hundreds of people who might ask him the same question. And he might not think twice before giving you his answer. And that's fast, isn't it? And let's suppose you ask him the next time, like, what is the next change? What is the next change of the movie? He might not have the answer. He might just ask the movie theater manager to get your answer. And that might be more time consuming compared to the information he already had readily available to him. So that piece of readily available information is cache. And the time he went back to his manager is the stored data in the volume or the database. So as we know, there are levels at which data is written to the memory. So the first level being level one, the register, L2, the second level, which is the cache, L3, the third level, which is the main memory. And the last one is the secondary memory, that is L4. There are other stages as well, but these are the most uh, important ones. So remember one thing very carefully that data is written to the cache and it's written one block at a time and each block also has a tag that includes the location where the data was stored in the cache. So if you look at the example here, we have our user, we have our cache memory and the database. So cache hit means the data that you received was successfully returned from the cache memory. Okay, by not disturbing your database which would be a very costly operation. Okay. And cache miss happens when the data you want isn't found on the cache memory, in turn has to be accessed from the database. And then it has to also be written onto the cache. So this is the primary difference between cache hit and cache miss. And if we turn the tables around and look at the elastic cache way, so just replace the cache and put your elastication between, and that can be your Redis or memcached, and it would work the same way as I explained just now smooth isn't it so you have the same principles here as well it's just the replacement of the actual elastic cache so let's see another use case for our solutions architect perspective the most important or you may say the most common use case that we have for any well-formed application is that the user always logs in to get access to the application and to help the user not to flip out and make it very easy when he tries using the application again the most widely used way is to store the user session data. So within the time limit, the user will exactly see what he wants as per his or her customization. So here is our user and uh, this is our application. And when the user logs in, we store the user data in Elastic Cache. Okay, and that is what we call our write session. And when the next request comes along, as we are using AWS and we are saints at designing applications, we use auto scaling groups in place for high availability. The request may be served by some other instance of the application. And the beauty of this or uh, beauty of using session store is that the app won't ask you to relog in again. It will straightforward. It will straight away let you use the app as if nothing happened. And that's where we have our read sessions where we get the same session back from Elastic Ish, and that would be pretty sick and pretty fast. Okay, so I hope you got an idea of what type of questions might be asked in the exam. Like let's suppose you have your web application running with ASG and you have a database and the user 
guests are having issues managing sessions and it's a bit slow so you might prefer using elastication okay so they may ask you like what type of service you want to use uh, that could be used here so if the option is given as elastication please choose that so here we are going to discuss on how we should use redis and memcached and it won't be asked as well but you should remember that when you see redis or memcached or user session store think elastication and make sure you read the questions thoroughly okay so let's move on so as i already told you there are two offerings from elastication redis and memcached and let's see what is the difference between both of them with the perspective of solutions architect and aws so the first thing that you need to remember is that both of these databases are in memory key value stores like a key and a value that's it pretty simple that's why it is very efficient so with redis you can keep your data on disk with a point in time snapshot which can be used for archiving or recovery but there are no snapshot provisions available for memcached and redis gives you multi easy replications so redis lets you create multiple replicas of a redis primary and this allows you to scale database reads and to have high available clusters highly available clusters so there are no replications for memcached so if you wish to have replications for your elasticase then you might use redis so redis supports transactions that let you execute a group of command a group of commands as an isolated or atomic operation but this feature is not available in memcached so redis supports pub sub messaging with pattern matching which you can use for high performance chat rooms real time comment streaming social media feeds and server intercommunication but there is no publisher or subscriber support of pattern matching in memcached and redis allows you to execute uh, transactional lua scripts but here on memcached you won't find that and there are no multi threading for uh, redis but memcached is multi threaded and it can make use of multi processing cores this means that you can handle more than one operation by by scaling up compute capacity okay so i hope this was clear and these are the points that you need to remember so let's move on so the next thing on the line for us with respect to elastication is security and caching strategies so with uh, redis first thing you get is in transit encryption that is for tls so it's the encryption of data at transit that we already know you enable in transit encryption on a replication group by setting the parameter transit encryption enable to true uh, in CLI terms, you can term it as hyphen hyphen transit hyphen encryption hyphen enable when you create the replication group. So next is uh, for the data at rest encryption in Elasticache for Redis. So it provides at rest encryption using the AWS KMS key, and uh, which can help you uh, both uh, for disk during sync, backup, and swap operations as well. And and it will help you for your backup stored in AWS S3 as well. The last one that we have here is authenticating users with Redis Auth and Redis authentication token enables uh, Redis to require a token or a password before allowing clients to execute commands thereby improving data security. Uh, you should remember this point because this came in the exam for uh, solutions architect in March 2020. So the question was like uh, our users are using Redis and how will you improve security for login. So you might see the option of Redis Auth and you can go ahead and choose it. And moving on to the Memcached. Uh, Memcached uses SASL based security authentication. I hope you might be aware of simple authentication security layer which unfortunately we won't be discussing in this session. So there are three caching strategies that we have for elastic cache and they are one is lazy loading, one is write through and one is adding TTL. And this is what we are going to learn next. And this is really important. So please pay attention. So lazy loading, it's very important. So please uh, pay attention to this. So lazy loading is a caching strategy that loads data into the cache only when necessary. So let's understand this with the visualization. But before that, I'll tell you something about Elasticache and uh, lazy loading. So what happens is, so Amazon Elasticache is an in-memory key value store that sits between your application and the data store or the database that you have. So whenever your application requests data, it first makes the request to the Elasticache. And if the data exists in the cache and is current, Elasticache returns the data to your application. So if the data does not exist in the cache or it has expired, your application requests the data from your data store or which is your database. Uh, we have our RDS databases and other databases, right? So a data store then returns the data of your application and your application then next writes the data received from the store to the cache. And this way it can be more quickly retrieved the next time it is requested. 
Okay, so what happens here is, so we have the application here and the Amazon RDS database here, and we have Elastic Cache sitting in between. So what happens here is, first the application will make a request and if the requested data is available in the Elastic Cache, it will be sent back to the application itself. And then what happens in another case, what if you make a request and if it is not available, then it will be sent to the database for its retrieval. So what happens here is if you are able to retrieve the data successfully from the cache, then it's a cache hit. And if you're not, then it's a cache miss. Okay, so this is basically the strategy of lazy loading. Here what happens is the cache hit occurs when the data is in cache and isn't expired and your application requests data from the cache and the cache returns the data to the application. And the cache miss, as I told you, occurs when the data isn't in the cache or is expired and the cache does not have the requested data. So it returns null and your application requests and receives the data from the database. Okay, and then the application updates the cache for the new data. Okay, and this is the full cycle of what we call as our lazy loading because most of the data is never requested and lazy loading avoids filling up the cache with data that isn't requested. Okay, so I hope this was clear. Let's move on to the next one. So in write through what happens and the strategy what we have here is it adds data or updates the data in the cache whenever data is written to the database. And because the data in the cache is updated every time it's written to the database, the data in the cache is always new or the latest or the current data. One more thing that happens here is that every write involves two operations. One, a write to the cache and the next one, a write to the database. So which adds latency to the process. Okay. So that said, end users are generally more tolerant of latency when updating data than when we are retrieving data. Okay. So because uh, you can spend more time when you're writing the data than while retrieving because while retrieving the data, if it is slow, then you get more frustrated, isn't it? And there is an inherent sense that updates are more work than thus take longer time. And this is a huge advantage on its own. So because as you think that while writing, it takes an update operation and or a post operation, it takes more time Then you are psychologically prepared that yes, it's going to be uh, taking a longer time, but while retrieving, you want the data to be fast. And the disadvantage here is if you spin up a new node, whether due to node failure or scaling out, you, you might lose your data until and unless it's added back. But this can be fixed if you use write through in conjunction with lazy loading. So if you have a lazy loading in place, then with write through, you can have it. And another interesting thing is most data is never read, which is a waste of resources. By adding a time to live or TTL value, you can minimize wastage space or wasted space. So which we will discuss next. So by adding TTL or time to live, as the name suggests, how long you are going to live. And it's the amount of time that the data will prevail in the cache. So time to live or TTL is an integer value that specifies the number of seconds until the key expires. Okay, so Redis can specify seconds or milliseconds for this value. When an application attempts to read an expired value, it is treated as though the key was not found. Okay, the database is queried for the key and the cache is updated again. And this approach doesn't guarantee that a value isn't stale. However, it keeps the data from getting too stale and requires that value in the cache are occasionally refreshed from the database. So with TTL, uh, you can get the best of both worlds, that is the lazy loading and write through. And this is the most sought after ca caching techniques. So I hope with this, you might have a strong understanding of how cache works and what we can do with it. And you should remember that when you see Redis, Memcached or user session store, think Elastic Cache. And most importantly, read the questions thoroughly. Hopefully, we will be doing a hands-on demo on this. So watch out for the next episode and please do subscribe, hit the like button and put down your comments and make sure you join me for the next session of AWS. Until then, Pytholic signing off.